the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Morning, everyone. This Sunday, we commemorate St. John Climacus and his work, The Ladder of Divine Ascent. And this book shows us ways that we can become free of the sins and the passions that keep us away from God and ways that we can draw closer to him and closer to life. And I'd like to focus on how this not only has a benefit for us personally, but can have a benefit for our whole community in these difficult times that we face. I'd like to start by looking at the gospel today from the gospel of Mark. And just prior to this reading that we have, the disciples had just experienced this great moment with Christ, the transfiguration, this mountaintop experience. And like them, we too have had it pretty good for a while here in Australia. We've had stability in our nation. We've had freedom to worship. We've had uninterrupted, uninterrupted access to the divine liturgy each week. And when we look at the history of the church, we see that this hasn't been the case for long stretches of time. We see the early Christians in the first three centuries suffering on and off under persecution. We see various plagues afflict Christians on and off as well. We see Christians struggling under Muslim rule in North Africa, in the Middle East, in Asia Minor for centuries. We see Christians struggling under Mongol rule in Kievan Russia in the 13th century or under communist rule in various different countries in the 20th century. Also in the 20th century, we see the uprooting of entire communities due to conflict. More recently, we see war in Syria and hardships for Christians in the Holy Land. So most of us have had nothing like these kinds of experiences. And here we are going through what we're going through now. So the disciples came down from Mount Tabor and saw close up someone suffering from seizures due to demonic possession. And the disciples were powerless to help. And we too have been brought down, so to speak, to see and experience close up the reality of our fallen world. And there's nothing like a global pandemic to make clear uh, and to remind us of the fallenness of creation. Like the disciples, we may feel powerless, afraid, and surrounded by people with no faith. Now later, when the disciples ask Christ why they couldn't have been uh, of more help, he says that this kind can only be driven out by prayer and fasting. And this is quite a remarkable thing to say because Jesus points out that their spiritual success and their impact on the well-being of others around them is connected intimately with their own private spirituality, their own private practice of prayer and fasting, the ascetic life. And in the same way, by our efforts, we can be collaborators with God to be true priests in this time to our community. And by that, I mean mediators of his saving and healing presence. And it's with this in mind that we come to this theme of this fourth Sunday of Lent of uh, the commemoration of St. John Climacus. And St. John lived in the Sinai Desert in St. Catherine's Monastery, becoming its abbot. He was born in the mid to late 500s and died in the early to mid 600s. Aside from the Bible and the service books of the church, there has been no other work that has been studied, copied, or translated more than the latter. It comprises 30 short chapters, which are analogous to the steps of a ladder. And each step looks at a vice or a sin to overcome or a virtue to acquire. St. John writes about each with stories, with metaphors, with imagery, with intensity, with humor, with humility. And it's intended for monastics, but it's so brilliant and so insightful into human nature that the church recommends everyone read it, hence placing it on this Sunday in Lent prominently. We gain several insights from it and from Christ's words in the gospel today that I'd like to share with you. And the first thing we see is that spiritual progress takes hard work. 
it's no accident that in St. John's work, the metaphor is of a ladder, which takes labor. It takes effort. We want things the easy way. We want quick results in our spiritual lives. That's what we're used to in the affluent West. The scriptural view, however, the Orthodox view, is one of struggle, one of toil. It's the patient farmer. It's the faithful soldier. It's those who endure to the end who will be saved. We have a saying in our church, give blood and receive the spirit. We find that the last step, the very last one in the ladder of divine ascent, step 30, is on faith, hope, and love. So really the message there is to get these as permanent features in our lives, faith, hope, and love. We have to do the tough spade work first of rooting out the sins from our heart and cultivating the virtues. Imagine a fireplace full of wet leaves, old wet pieces of wood and wet ashes. You can't light a fire there. You need to clean out the wet rubbish first. This is the removal of our sins. And then add clean, dry wood and kindling. This is cultivating the virtues. Ready for the fire of God. And only God can light, so to speak, that kindling in our hearts and bring his fire by his power. So it's important to be clear on what the ladder of divine ascent is not. It's not a system of merit where we earn our way into heaven. There's nothing we can do to, to earn God's love. And it's not appeasing the wrath of God, like people whipping themselves in medieval plagues or something to attempt to satisfy God and reduce their suffering. It's all about inner work on ourselves. We need healing. We receive the spirit like a tiny seed in our baptism. And the scriptures tell us that it's the person who sells all she owns to buy the field with the treasure who gets the treasure. It's the person who sells all he has to buy the pearl of great price, who gets the pearl. St. Sophrony of Essex, after spending 22 years on Mount Athos, went to Europe and he says he found it completely disorientating. And he writes this, what monks acquired after decades of weeping, our contemporaries think to receive after a brief interval, sometimes even after a few hours of pleasant theological discussion. Christ's words, his every word came to this world from on high. They belong to a sphere of other dimensions and can be assimilated only by means of prolonged prayer with much weeping. We find an, uh, an example of true prayer in the gospel, in the character of the father of this young man, where he cries out to God, uh, to Christ, I believe, help my unbelief. And the desperate situation that he's in drives an honest, heartfelt prayer. We find in history that monastics left behind comfortable lives because they could sense that an easy existence would render their prayers infertile. Their flight into the desert was to cultivate a situation of heartache where true prayer could be perfected. Now we have a situation that's been imposed on us and we can use it as an opportunity for true prayer. Uh, we could fight this situation. We could pretend it's not there. We could try to make the most of it like many people are. But we must let it become an opportunity for true prayer. Maybe some of us are feeling like we are praying for real for the first time in our lives. Have you noticed the prayers of the divine liturgy and the other services of the church take on a new significance? To you, the champion queen, our defense from all forms of danger you have delivered us that we may cry unto you, hail, O virgin, unwedded bride. Metropolitan Anthony Bloom in his book, Beginning to Pray, says that most of the time our prayers are feeble, they're half-hearted, they're the shadows of real prayer. And he borrows an image from St. John Climacus, and that is to speak of 
prayer like an arrow being fired to God. And he says, it's not enough to have the right words. The right words are like an, uh, an arrow, but we need a bow and that bow needs a good string and a strong arm is required to operate this bow correctly to fire this arrow in a true fashion. So he says, if the words of a prayer are like an arrow, the bow is our attentiveness or our attention to what we are saying. And the string is an intense feeling of the heart or maybe what we would call being fully invested in what we are saying. The strong arm that draws back the string is a lifestyle that supports the prayer, a lifestyle of humility, a lifestyle of repentance, one that follows Christ's commandments. So these things working together are what make for true prayer with the words as the arrow, the bow as our attention, the string as this intense feeling of the heart and having a lifestyle that backs this up. And he says that we don't just fire this arrow into nothingness, but we aim it into the center of our hearts. Our commandrite Zacharias says that we can turn this time, this plague, into a triumph of hesychasm, of stillness, of watchfulness, of true interior prayer. And James 5.16 reminds us that the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And this is what our world needs right now, people of true prayer. We can also use the outward circumstances around us as an opportunity for holiness. Father Perry Callis from Chicago says that we can't stand still on a ladder, right? No one climbs a ladder to just kind of just hang there on the fourth rung, just checking out the scenery, right? Uh, unless you're spying on your neighbors or something like that, in which case, you know, you need to sort out those, those issues. Um, but we, we climb a ladder to make progress to get to a destination. And in a similar way, we need to make progress in our lives. He also points out that we don't just climb with our feet, right? We can't just walk up the ladder. Neither do we climb a ladder just with our hands, right? but it's a combination of our hands and our feet working together. We need to have contact with different rungs at the same time. And what this makes clear is that we have a need for various positive actions to take place at the same time. We might be working on our faith and at the same time we require humility, gentleness and self-control. We will all have different vices to face, especially now that we are living in almost semi-monastic conditions, being isolated in the way that we are. And these things may become more apparent due to the intense nature of, uh, of life at the moment. Some of us may experience boredom, tedium, listlessness, laziness, frittering our days away, doing not a whole lot much good. Uh, with others, it will be a struggle with, uh, with lust, with gluttony, with excesses of various different kinds. With others, it'll be succumbing to anger and irritation, especially perhaps in places where people are spending more time in close proximity with each other. With others, it will be despair, fear at what's happening in our world and still yet with others perhaps an insensitivity or a coldness to the plight of other people around us. Now St. John in the latter has something to say on each of these and we can access the text online for, for free and read what might pertain to us. We see moreover in this time where we cannot have communion of the body and blood of Christ that cultivating righteousness allows us to commune with God anyway by an act of His grace. And St. Theophan the Recluse says that though communion through the Holy Mysteries can happen only occasionally, 
It can be unceasing in the person who always keeps his or her heart pure and his or her attention and feeling constantly directed towards the Lord. This is a gift of grace granting, uh, granted to people struggling on the path of the Lord if they are diligent and pitiless to themselves. All that we can bring is thirst and hunger for this gift and diligent striving to obtain it. There are, however, works which open the way to this communion with the Lord and help to obtain it, although it always seems to come as it were unexpectedly. The works are pure prayer with childlike crying of the heart and special acts of self-denial in the practice of the virtues. Among acts of self-denial, the most powerful of all for this purpose is humble obedience and casting oneself under the feet of all people, stripping oneself of acquisitiveness and suffering injustice with a good heart. All this in the spirit of complete surrender to the will of God. Such actions liken a person to the Lord more than any others, and the Lord present in him allows his soul to taste him. Our communion with God can be a healing presence to those around us, and it can be the best thing that we can offer our world at this time. To conclude, when men and women fled into the wilderness, they had only the silence and the cave, or silence and the desert. But we have the stories of the saints. We have the scriptures. We have books like The Ladder of Divine Ascent. We have all the services of the church live streamed into our very rooms in what Bishop Thomas of the US calls a sanctification of the internet. We have the full daily and weekly cycle of services available to us whereby we can sanctify our time. We have advanced spiritual practices to help us grow in holiness and prayer and find God within. We have the depth of spirituality, in short, that will keep our planet going. We can repent on behalf of a people that does not know how to repent. In Romans 8.19, we read that all creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. May we be the people that our world needs at this time. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
thy right hand be forgotten. If I set not Jerusalem above all other, as at the head of my joy, against me.